When she was completed, in December 1906, HMS Dreadnought was the most powerful battleship in the world. She was the first big gun battleship to enter service, and the first battleship to be powered by a Parsons steam turbine. As a result, she was two and a half knots faster than her rivals, and carried twice the firepower of earlier battleships. 27. 12 pounder high velocity guns in single mounts were also fitted. These had a maximum firing range of about 8,500 metres to 8.5 kilometres, as well as five 18 inch submerged torpedo tubes, two on each beam, and one fitted aft. She could fire white head torpedoes out of these, and these were effective up to about 730 metres. These travelled at about a speed of 26.5 knots. Her armour was on par with a Lord Nelson class. With places, the armour was thicker and some were thinner. She had a belt between 4 inches on the stem and the stern and is thickened to 11 inches between the magazines. Deck armour was 0.75 to 3 inches. The barbette armour was 4 inches, raising up to about 11 inches just underneath the turret. The turrets were 3 to 12 inches. The conning tower was 11 inches and her bulkheads were 8 inches thick. The all big gun ship was an idea that was in the air for years. In America, work had already begun designing the South Carolina class, which when completed carried 8 12 inch guns. And there had actually been calls to give the Lord Nelsons an all 12 gun armament. Dreadnought was the first of these ships to be laid down in October 1905 and was built at great speed. She was launched just over four months later in February 1906 and was officially considered to have been completed in October 1906, just after one year. In fact, it would take another two months for her to be completed, but this is still the shortest period of time it's taken to complete a battleship. Dreadnought suffered from a series of minor design flaws, however. Some were easily avoidable. The tripod mast, which carried the fire control platform, was placed immediately behind the forward funnel, making it useless at high speed, as it quickly filled with smoke, and also got really hot. The main belt of armour placing was not tall enough, and when the ship was at full load, it was entirely submerged, while the next layer of armour above the belt was not tall enough, leaving most of the ship protected by 4 inches of armour. The secondary armament, designed to fight off destroyers and torpedo boats, was too weak. Using 12 pounder guns instead of 4 inch guns used in earlier ships. And later, Dreadnought corrected this. The layout of the 12 inch guns was also not ideal. Where they were carried in 5 twin mounts, 3 were on the centre line and 2 were carried, 1 port and 1 starboard of the tripod mast. This means that only 4 turret could be used in a single broadside while the middle of the three turret center line was carried at the same level as the rearmost turret, giving it a restricted arc of fire. This reduced the effective firepower of the ship to eight 12 inch guns against targets on the same side, the normal case in naval warfare. Perhaps the most innovative design was using the Parsons steam turbine to provide power. This was a new design had not been used on any previous battleship. Indeed, in 1905, not large commercial ships used turbines, and the first British cruiser to use them had not yet gone to sea, whereas the first turbine-powered destroyer was only four years old by this point. Now, the turbines were the real key to the success of Dreadnought. The Lord Nelson-class ships were powered by four cylindrical triple-expansion engines, providing 16,750 indicated shaft horsepower. The four shaft Parsoned turbine in Dreadnought provided 23,000 shaft horsepower. The real difference was even larger. Shaft horsepower reflected the real amount of power provided, while indicated horsepower tends to overreport the available power. The turbines also had a massive impact on the working environment of the engine room, making it a much more pleasant and a lot less noisy place to work in. HMS Dreadnought was so much powerful than any battleship in existence, and she made every older ship obsolete overnight. From 1906, the world battle fleets were divided into Dreadnoughts and Pre-Dreadnoughts. 
A new dreadnought race broke out between Britain and Germany, which helped raise tensions in Europe, and subsequently became one of the catalysts for the start of World War I. Despite the massive amount of money that was spent on dreadnoughts over the next eight years, when war came, they did not live up to expectations. The so-called Super Trafalgar that everyone wished for in the North Sea never happened. And the nearest the British and German dreadnoughts came to each other it was generally disappointing at the Battle of Jutland. The dreadnoughts had a qu generally quiet war. At the start of the war, she s sent to Scapa Flow as the flagship of the 4th Battle Squadron of the Grand Fleet. In December 1914, she was replaced by, as flagship by the newly completed HMS Benbow, an Iron Duke class battleship carrying 10 13.5 inch guns. On the 18th of March 1915, the Dreadnought became the only battleship in existence to sink a submarine during the war. The Grand Fleet was at sea conducting tactical exercises when U-29 fired a torpedo at the fleet. Dreadnought and Marlborough sighted the tor submarine, and a chase began. After 10 minutes, the Dreadnought rammed the submarine, hitting her with her Rambo, and subsequently going over, started chopping the submarine up with her propeller blades. She subsequently sank with the loss of all hands. In May 1916, the Dreadnought was moved to Sheerness as flagship of the 3rd Battle Squadron. This squadron had been moved south in the aftermath of the German raids on Lower Soft on the 25th of April, which had seen the German high seas fleet bombard the east coast without any interference from the battleships of the Grand Fleet. In March 1918, she returned to the Grand Fleet as flagship of the 4th Battle Squadron before being paid off in July 1918. In February 1919, she was placed in reserve at Rosyth, and in 1920, she went on the sale list. And subsequently, she was scrapped, which is a very big disappointment to a naval historian. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully you learned something new. And if you have, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and uh, follow me on Discord, where you can ask for ships for me to do. Anyway, take care, folks. Have a good one. See you next time.